we don't talk about black labor movements enough. It's almost really weird to me that we don't, or at least not more often, the same way a lot of white leftists don't read any black writers or revolutionaries. Though they still claim to stand the Black Panthers, name five of their best albums with composers. I think most frustratingly it's the slavery era that's really left out, which is annoying because the slaves fighting against rising capitalism and their place within its systems are templates for many of our struggles today. Slave rebellions were actually surprisingly successful and definitely belong somewhere within the left understanding of labor relations and slave classes under capitalism, which still exist. For this video, I'm going to walk you through a sort of short summary of black labor movements from the past and present, from slavery to unions. If you want to help me make videos like this one, you can go to my Patreon. You can go to my Patreon and become one of my patrons, which was a surprisingly difficult sentence to say. You know, the point is, go to my Patreon and make sure I can pay my rent. Thank you. The elegance and some would say folly of Dubois' general strike thesis rests upon its simplicity. Slaves are workers. As workers, slaves constantly struggled with their masters not only over their working conditions, but also over their legal and social status as human beings. The end game for any slave insurgency was not just to own the means of production, but to own one's very self. This yearning for freedom found its climax during the American Civil War, where slaves increasingly ran away, took up arms against their masters, and intentionally sabotaged and disrupted global cotton production. These actions were not accidents. They were a form of politics. They emanated from a class-conscious slave community. For Dubois, the general strike forced the hand of President Lincoln, turning a war to save the Union into a war to end slavery. In this way, the American Civil War should not be euphemistically romanticized as a war between the states, but instead re-understood as the most massive slave revolt in the history of the New World. Slaves freed themselves. It was a revolution, one that came and went, a splendid failure. When we talk about slave revolts, the only one that gets focused on, at least in my experience in the school system, is the Haitian Revolution. And while that's an extremely important event that shifted the conversation on slavery heavily and threw the balance of world power out of whack for a long time, it is not the only slave rebellion of its kind. In fact, slave rebellions were actually really common. Turns out when you abuse a bunch of people and force them to do your labor with sharp objects, they start getting ideas with those objects. And sometimes they get good ideas and you end up getting juked by an army of 19 year old black kids. Hey, did you know that more than half of the slaves in the US around the time of the Civil War were younger than 16? Also, many slaves didn't live past 25 because of horrible living and labor conditions. The point is that the Haitian Revolution was not the only one of its kind. Slave rebellions in the US were fairly common. Everyone's heard of Nat Turner's rebellion. But during the Civil War, those rebellions crippled the South. W.E.B. Du Bois would be the first historian to apply a Marxist critique of what happened during these rebellions, though many historians would refuse to accept that slave rebellions won the war since it was a political hot take that was not very popular at the time. In the years that followed, historians shied away from any description of the Civil War as a slave rebellion, not because it was inaccurate, but because of the interpretation's explosive politics at the time, when national leaders were trying to tamp down black activism and reunify whites in the North and South. But regardless of how popular it was, Dubois Marx's critique made sense, and it's still neglected in the modern day. Slave rebellions were an effort from a hyper-exploited working class trying to seize ownership of the means of production, their very bodies. Slaves were simultaneously the means of production to be seized and the workers seizing them. Slaves organized their rebellions in religious gatherings and churches, similar to how Haitian slaves organized during their own religious proceedings away from the prying eyes of their masters, while providing each other with the kinds of community support needed to stage this kind of movement. While the North struggled to bolster its forces among draft riots from northern whites, escaped and rebelling slaves joined the northern army in droves, leading extremely successful raids like General Harriet Tubman, the first woman to lead a U.S. military operation, attacking plantations and vital points of supply for the Confederacy, freeing more and more slaves and building their numbers as they went, while facing lynchings and torture that white Union soldiers didn't face if caught. Captured white soldiers were prisoners of war. Captured black soldiers were shot en masse by the Confederacy. Still, they fought and won the war for the North. To see how enslaved people were able to coordinate a general strike, Henderson looks at the conditions in the Southern economy in the years before the war. He notes that many enslaved workers were not isolated on plantations, but employed in growing industrial operations. Some, particularly skilled artisans, were hired out, working in a manner similar to wage workers but without pay. Henderson writes that this practice radicalized workers by making it obvious how much value they were creating without any compensation. It also gave enslaved artisans a chance to meet and discuss their grievances together. These artisans, along with preachers and other enslaved workers who traveled as part of their jobs, formed a nexus for mobilization. 
Sadly though, America's wealth in the North and South heavily relied on black labor, so slavery was not ended but amended. It became legal to own slaves as long as they were criminals, so black people were heavily criminalized more than any other population and forced to follow black codes, laws which structured themselves to stamp out black activism and organizing and force them back to the same plantations and jobs they rebelled against, but now for a pittance of the pay and the threat of jail or lynching if they didn't work. Just being out in public without a job or out after dark sundown laws or out in public while not actively working, loitering, or being near white women and other laws that would eventually become Jim Crow meant that in many places black people were legally free, but faced many of the same conditions they faced before. Not much really changed. Regardless, their movement has valuable lessons for us to take away, and their struggle and legacy is still alive in all of us who came before them. For a lot of leftists, workers' unions are the ultimate pro-gamer move. We have an idea in our head of workers' unions being the most powerful and useful expression of workers' power, but we fail to address how, in history, plenty of unions were not for all workers, and how getting that was a struggle in and of itself. Black organizer Isaac Myers, after struggling to organize despite racism he faced, wrote, Everywhere, the white trades union prohibits the admission of colored men as members. Don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-union. The history of race and racism within unions is an under-discussed aspect, but for a long time unions were exclusionary to non-white members, or even worked to further racist agendas against people of color. There are plenty of examples of things like white unions going on strike, being replaced by black workers for cheap because those black people were systemically barred from better pay in unions and needed jobs, then those white unions beating the shit out of black workers instead of having solidarity with them and forming a stronger union by teaming up, or white workers rising up to do a little ethnic cleansing on POC workers, getting an even shittier deal than they are in the same job. After the Civil War, many black people faced terrible exploitative labor conditions and sharecropping plantations were barred from skilled labor and systemically barred from organizing for their labor. This, combined with anti-black workers' unions, created massive barriers for black people looking to struggle for better labor conditions. The Knights of Labor for a time were a union open to black membership, but they fell apart in the 19 but they fell apart in the 1890s due to government crackdowns after the Haymarket Affair, and black workers were left looking for new options. There were exceptions to the standard segregated union though. The IWW, International Workers of the World, actually started off desegregated when they were formed in the 1910s. Their bylaws read, no working man or working woman shall be excluded from membership in local unions because of creed or color. Nice. And they presented a strong challenge to the American Federation of Labor's divisive methods of organizing when they were formed, on the basis of industrial unionism rather than craft unionism. Basically, craft unions organized on the basis of the job one did, whereas industrial unionism combined all the workers in a given workplace or industry into a single union. So, you know, not everyone necessarily doing the same job, but all of them are doing this particular job they do for a specific industry or company. Alongside them, predominantly and all black unions, rose to challenge the AFL and other segregated unions. An organized labor movement emerged after the Civil War in response to growing industrialization, but it was largely hostile or indifferent to the needs and desires of freed people. As a result, black workers in many cities organized their own unions or associations to represent their members' interests. In Baltimore, Maryland, for instance, Isaac Myers, 1835-1891, to who had been born to free parents in 1835, defended his fellow black ship caulkers who lost their jobs when white workers, many of them demobilized Confederate soldiers, went to strike to demand the firing of black shipyard workers. In 1866, Myers helped to establish the Chesapeake Marine Railway and Dry Dock Company, a black-owned and operated company that gave employment to hundreds of unemployed black ship workers before it finally closed in 1883. Since white unions excluded blacks as members, Myers vigorously advocated all black unions. He saw them as a way of increasing black workers' power and also of fostering eventual alliances with trade unions. When the all-white National Labor Union refused to admit black organizations into the membership, Myers, in 1869, founded and led the short-lived Colored National Labor Union, a federation of recently formed associations of black ship caulkers, longshoremen, hod carriers, and other laborers. But Myers' optimism about the possibility of an alliance between black and white workers did not survive the depression of the 1870s. By 1881, he had concluded that the prejudice of white labor against blacks was simply too strong. Everywhere, he wrote, the white trades union prohibits the, the admission of colored men as members. As long as these organizations were effective, he argued, black mechanics would gradually drop into obscurity and the grave. 
It's a prime example of how workers' movements, unions, and people's movements can leave people behind and thus fail by failing to address prejudices and discrimination within its members. But I mean, so are all the queer people left or abandoned by leftist movements throughout history, but whatever. With few options for workers' representation, for a swelling black population in the North fleeing racist violence like the Tulsa Race Massacre and seeking job opportunities, black labor activists formed their own union, such as the aforementioned Colored National Labor Union in 1889 and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925. Another powerful union in this era was the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which was split off from the AFL in 1935 and came to represent the industries that the AFL didn't at the time represent, like steel workers, auto workers, and meat packers. The CIO also didn't hesitate to represent black workers. In 1935, several unions broke away from the AFL to form a, ri a rival labor federation, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The CIO took the position that all workers in a given factory or industry, regardless of their specific tasks or skills, race, ethnicity, or sex, ought to belong to a single organization. The new CIO conducted extensive organizing campaigns in the late 1930s and 1940s, winning victories that produced substantial gains for their members. Success in unionizing the steel, auto, and meatpacking and other basic industries required the support and active involvement of African American workers. Failure to recruit black support would likely guarantee the loss of any union drive, and the CIO, unlike the AFL, actively sought black participation. Eventually, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, would charter the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, an all-black union founded by A. Philip Randolph that had gained official recognition organizing for workers' rights and civil rights in New York. Their gaining official recognition from their Pullman Company in 1935, and with it, vastly improved conditions for the workers it represented, and then-President Asa Randolph's appointment to AFL-CIO Vice President in 1955, gave more weight to black unions and helped lead to the desegregation that would be achieved by the civil rights movement. In fact, the civil rights movement would borrow tactics from these labor movements, and figures like Asa Randolph and Bayard Rustin, both famous black labor activists at this time, would help organize the March on Washington. Martin Luther King and other activists not only supported unions, but received massive support from them. Workers' unions provided activists with places to operate out of, transportation by various means, and were even bailed out of jail by them. After the two men met and became fast friends in 1959, the United Auto Automobile Workers, UAW President Walter Philip Ruther, marched alongside Dr. King at Selma in Birmingham and bailed him out of jail. The, a the UAW was a major supporter of the March on Washington, as well as other civil rights actions. And in the 1950s, the Union donated funds to the Montgomery bus boycott and paid bail for freedom riders arrested in 1961. The Union offered Dr. King and the other organizers their Union headquarters as the base of operations to plan the 1963 march and chartered trains, buses, and planes to get workers there. The AFL-CIO President George Meany wavered endorsing the march, but when more than 800 protesters were attacked by police and arrested during civil disobedience actions on April 7, 1963, prior to the march, the UAW sent $160,000 in bail money to free them. Ruther himself was the only white person to speak at the podium at the march itself, using the platform to demand freedom for the nation's second-class citizens, frame civil rights as a matter of common decency, and make fiery allusions to the evils of racist government officials following Dr. King's assassination. Ruther marched, Ruther marched alongside Coretta Scott King in Memphis and donated $50,000 to the striking sanitation workers that Dr. King worked so hard to help. And that is a very brief history of black workers unions. Emphasis on brief. The history is long and complicated and I would highly recommend looking into figures like Bayard Rustin and Asa Randolph and, and checking out books like Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. And remember that these videos are not the end of the topic. I'm a study partner, not a teacher. Keep reading and learning. And in the meantime, check out Patreon to see the scripts of these videos early and other bonus content and stuff like that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you out.